Thank you so much. Uh, it's quite a pleasure to be here uh, on the occasion of this uh, seminar. Um, I want to, I was talking with Francine. Um, it was uh, back in 2004 when I organized the first uh, trip to the United Nations. And we have many good memories. We usually live very early in the morning, as you know, those of you who came. And so we had no news. When we went to the UN, it was uh, when we were sitting there that we, it was announced that uh, Wangari Mathai had been uh, nominated, selected as a Nobel laureate, the first African woman. It was quite an event, the, the excitement. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, this year, uh, after many other following years, we had uh, other uh, Humphrey Fellows uh, contribute to the trip to the UN. And I was very, very much pleased by the uh, positive spirit and engagement of the group this year that came uh, to the trip. It was our 10th trip to the UN. And I was actually thinking of organizing an event to commemorate it. Uh, because of so many other engagement, I couldn't do it. So I see this as <laughs> the commemoration of the 10th uh, trip to the United Nations. Uh, I would like to specify that uh, the uh, presidency that uh, you uh, kind, uh, thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, actually, it is a comparative and international education society, which is a, is a professional organization a US based and uh, Canada, uh, which is a member of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies. And so I was elected uh, last year. Uh, it has a membership of close to 3,000 people from across the globe. Uh, and uh, this year I have become um, a president elect. And one of my responsibilities as president elect is to organize the next year annual conference. And so uh, the comparative education organizes annual conferences and all the comparative education societies that are members of the World Council participate, uh, the membership participate in a meeting that is organized every three, four years across the globe. But this one is every year for the US and Canada and also globally uh, based uh, comparative education. So next year conference will be in Washington, DC. The board has approved my proposal to hold it in Washington, DC from March 8th to uh, 13th. So wherever you are, you are invited to come. Even if you leave the US, go back to your <coughs> respective homes. Uh, I hope that you will uh, come back, uh, check later to find more information on the web of the CIES, Comparative and International Education Society. Uh, because of, uh, I know uh, it's great to have this opportunity, but the time is very limited. So I will do my very best to go quickly so that we can have uh, uh, some time left for uh, converse conversation. Um, and I want to thank again Francine, who has been a, a great colleague and a very uh, visionary and uh, really based uh, uh, in the community uh, and uh, reaching out to uh, the whole world and trying to make all of us uh, have a great experience uh, no matter how long or how shortly we stay here at Cornell. Uh, my presentation will have a, uh, there will be a very brief introduction and then, uh, okay, so. Okay, the introduction and then after the introduction, uh, there will be six sections. Um, the UN and the Global Development and Africa. Um, education in Africa, I put uh, Sub-Saharan Africa because sometimes there's a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa um, and for the development policy. Although Africa as is a region uh, from the United Nations and therefore it's uh, the whole continent. And then uh, higher education, uh, the eight millennium development goals. I will go very quickly through those because I'm sure that you have seen them. I was actually planning to be here earlier to hear everybody, but I had some 
engagement uh, in the office. And then the fourth will be education in Africa, patterns in the global context, and higher education and gender equity, the African in the, uh, and uh, international trends, and the new African development planning vision beyond uh, 2015, and the conclusion. Please let me know how many minutes I have so that I can speed up. Uh, how, uh, until when I can uh, talk? 25 minutes, so uh, to uh, one twenty. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, going back. Uh, introduction. Well, of course, um, education and development and social progress is a is a universal. But uh, as we all know, there are specific uh, national, regional speci uh, uh, need. Uh, as uh, that uh, are usually and uh, should be normally articulated by those who know the best, their need and their conditions. Um, and so the United Nations and uh, uh, development in Africa in the global uh, context, well, um, following the decolonization of Africa, the United Nations took um, the lead, literally, uh, on the global scale to support Africa's effort to uh, advance uh, socially, economically, and so and so forth. And the UN was created in 1945, as you know, and uh, you have suddenly revisited that, and UNESCO was created in 1948 with a focus on, uh, on education. So there has been uh, a deliberate effort by the uh, different uh, UN agencies to support Africa in its effort to um, deal with some of the uh, inequalities that were created in the context of uh, colonization. And when we analyze colonization, because we don't have the time, but the colonization of Africa was relatively sh a short period. However, that colonization was uh, historically, structurally linked to the transatlantic enslavement. So it is centuries of impact of the European uh, intrusion in Africa, and its, uh, its consequences are immense. And so after the formal decolonization process that started in the mid-1950s, um, and uh, with the majority of the Af a large number of African countries acquiring their independence in 1960, there was the effort from within and also outside uh, to advance using education as a very important instrument for socioeconomic advancement. And as I just mentioned, the UN took a, the lead. For instance, I'll give just a few examples because of lack of time. Uh, for instance, during the 16th session of its General Assembly on December 19, 1961, the United Nations adopted several resolutions that directly focused on Africa's educational and socioeconomic development. They included um, Resolution 1710, uh, which declared the 1960s, the, and I quote, the United Nations Development Decade. And that was not for Africa only. It was a global uh, uh, effort or global reach. And some among the re resolution uh, focused uh, specifically on Africa. For instance, resolution 1710, uh, 1717 was on African educational development, uh, while resolution 1718 was on the economic development of Africa. So these are just a few examples. There were many, many efforts uh, uh, to uh, uh, really uh, organize African education to reshape it so that it can meet the huge challenges of development uh, that uh, the country, the whole continent, found itself in. And interestingly, the same year, 1961, uh, the African countries themselves met in Addis Ababa and adopted uh, the ministers of the countries that had been just uh, acquired their independence even the countries that were still struggling for independence. And as you know, uh, many of them, it will take a while throughout the 1960s. And even in the case of Namibia, it was not until 1990. 
and some consider the black majority, uh, the vote, general uh, electoral system in South Africa, 1994, as the formal end of the decolonization process, although there is still a situation that is being dealt with, the um, Sahrawi uh, situation. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that at that time, uh, countries that were independent or not independent yet, they all agreed on the critical importance of education uh, as a means for socioeconomic development and therefore met at the, this historic uh, 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 gathering in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. At the conference, at this conference on educational need of Africa, uh, the African representative were very confident in the role that education was supposed to play in development. And they, accordingly, enthusiastically agreed on the targeted uh, targets to be reached by the 1980s. And the targets were universal free and compulsory primary schooling, uh, secondary education for 30% of all uh, uh, children who finished uh, primary school, and out of those who finished uh, secondary school, at least 20% would complete, uh, would move on to higher education. So there was that confidence that education would, would, uh, would uh, contribute to uh, the advancement of African societies. Um, so there were specific historical moments in, uh, in African uh, 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 the decades that followed. I would like to just uh, briefly mention uh, some of them. Um, I mentioned the, the period, the rupture, when the Europeans uh, um, moved into Africa on stages uh, throughout the centuries, uh, highlighted uh, or um, culminating with the uh, colonization after the Berlin Conference of the uh, end of the 19th century. And the second period uh, correspond to the struggle for decolonization and equality uh, and the demand that Africa, that European education system be transferred to Africa. The third period concerned the high demand for European type of education in Africa. Uh, there were some contradictions there that uh, we don't have time. Uh, time doesn't, um, would not allow me to elaborate on, but I hope we can uh, uh, address some of them in the question and answer period. Because um, uh, the contradiction was that uh, Africans were rejecting European colonization, and the education from Europe was an instrument for the colonization, and that same instrument, African people wanted it. So it created some major issues that we're still dealing with, that that education was not meant to be the instrument for advancement, for social progress, for the colonized. So it's difficult to transform it later on into that uh, precisely that instrument. So many of those contradictions are there. But still, that, that was, uh, it was that uh, period. After rejecting entirely the European education in the beginning as an alien and so and so forth, uh, now the African moved to fully embrace it, uh, leading to the um, decolon decolonization uh, period. Um, so then there was that um, um, global um, agreement, enthusiasm about the need to develop the European education. And the United Nations, as I mentioned, was leading really in the effort. And then came the 1970s to 1990s, when in the context of severe economic crisis, uh, questions started to be asked about the capacity of formal education to lead to, um, to, lead to development. And the uh, World Bank, uh, the infamous structural adjustment programs, uh, had uh, far-reaching implications. I don't, cannot go through the details here. And then the fifth period is when the Africans, uh, there was in that particular context uh, something that happened very uh, ironic. Uh, the 1980s that were targeted as the year uh, or, or beginning of the decade when the African were to achieve all those uh, um, 
targets that I mentioned earlier at the, uh, uh, reach at the Addis Ababa conference is precisely when, as a result of the economic crisis and as a result also of the structural adjustment programs that were imposed, well, the World Bank would say accepted freely, <laughs> the African and many others say imposed, um, there was a process of declining enrollment, an extraordinary phenomenon. I was teaching in Togo when from literally one year to the next, there was that phenomenon of decline, primary, secondary, uh, high education. Um, and so that period was followed by another period, the realization that there were actually very few alternatives to education, and therefore demand for education started to grow again. Okay. And so this is the context of uh, the UN re-engaging uh, the, the uh, development process through formal education. What I should say is that during that period, of uh, the period when uh, education was considered uh, the uh, instrument for development, higher education enjoyed a particular, particular status because this is where the decision makers, the most uh, critical thinkers, those who had the technical capacity, the planners, I, at a period when development was uh, more within the framework of planning, national planning uh, units and so and so forth. So the expert who could design the planning, uh, to, could have, who could have the capacity to look at the broader uh, economic need and man, uh, manipulate the statistics and so and so forth. So higher education was considered key. And this is where the professionals in specific areas, the medical doctors, um, the agricultural engineers, you name it, areas that were off limit during the colonial time when the Africans were not allowed to go beyond a few years of, of schooling, even when they accepted to go to the European school. So there, at that time also, um, um, the um, human capital theory, was, which was the framework, the theoretical framework that was used, that posits that there is a linear and a positive correlation between education and development. At the individual level, the higher the uh, level of education, the higher the probability for socioeconomic attainment. And at the uh, aggregate level, at the national level, at the community level, the higher the aggregate level of education, the higher the development. But at that time also, the indicators of development were like the GDP, GNP per capita, and so and so forth. Uh, and so it was not actually only in Africa or other developing countries, it was global, right here in the United States. Uh, education was also considered to be the instrument that would help end the st uh, social inequality. At some point, there was the argument that racism has uh, kind of uh, disappeared. So the negative reaction to black people and so and so forth here was not because of racism. It's because black people in general didn't have access to education, equal access, and so if they acquired the same level of education as anybody else, they would not be discriminated against. And throughout Europe, and even where well, we don't have time, because the whole notion of human capital as an academic discussion took another level, whereby there was, it was used to actually make a critique of the Soviet and the Eastern Bloc that was criticizing capitalism. And the argument, intellectual argument, is that capitalism is not so essentially bad as it was being claimed. And actually, everybody is potentially a capitalist because we all have human capital in ourselves. And therefore, a capitalism it, uh, is not uh, a problem. So there was this interesting debate that was going on. Uh, and the point I want to make is that it's not only in Africa, however, uh, came the uh, economic crisis, structural adjustment, and uh, the emphasis on uh, basic education. And in African countries, uh, higher education was considered actually, instead of being the level at which the hopes should be placed in, 
it's actually the level that constituted part of the problem in terms of the uh, allocation of resources, disproportionate uh, uh, um, share of, uh, of the uh, national budget and so and so forth. So uh, it's more complicated than that, but this led to um, the process of devaluing actually higher education. The question was not what type of higher education, but it was as if it's higher education in itself that was a problem. Therefore, the emphasis should be on basic education. That was the context in which the Junction uh, <coughs> Conference was held in 1990, Education for All, and the Dakar, and so the MDGs, have been analyzed also as part of whatever the intention, but it has been part of that uh, effort to put the emphasis on basic education. So um, I'll go very, the eight uh, uh, goals, you have reviewed them, so maybe I should move on quickly. They have been? Okay, so, okay. And then there have been some evaluations. I, I look there, uh, time is going very fast. So um, I, I suppose also maybe I want to complement what has been done instead of repeating. So you have reviewed, uh, you have seen the review of, okay. So then I'm going to go quickly through all these, uh, the, the different goals. But what I would like us to see still uh, while doing this is to see where Africa is. Uh, in each of them, Africa is not faring well at all compared to the others. But then we need to see Africa as a continent with more than 50 countries. So there is considerable variation from one country to another because of the difference in the resources that uh, the countries have, a difference in the commitment of the leadership a difference in uh, the involvement of the population, a difference in all sorts of factors that constitute an important input in any effort to uh, advance in the MDG, achievement of the MDGs. So for the remaining time, uh, I'm going to go quickly through. Uh, uh, you can see it clearly there. In each of them, you see uh, uh, s what is uh, classified here as sub-Saharan Africa not doing well. Doing better than when the MDGs uh, started, but in comparison to the other regions, it's not, um, yeah, um, okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm skipping literally the goals instead of analyzing each of them. Um, and then the question here, going back to the goals, uh, what, what is the role of higher education in each of them? Each of these goals, there's no way you can eradicate poverty and hunger if you do not articulate higher education. And going back to the earlier commitment. Ah, point to, yeah, oh, okay, 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 thank you. Uh, poverty, hunger. I talked earlier when there was that uh, major commitment to, uh, to uh, uh, increase higher education enrollment. The thought was to produce agricultural engineers and so and so forth. So are we saying now that agricultural engineers in the context of Africa are no longer needed? No one said that they were not needed, but it was not. Uh, it was not articulated consistently as a necessary input, as a necessary component, as a necessary uh, uh, parameter in the equation of uh, MDGs. So that's my criticism. Um, achieve universal primary education. Higher education is very important in basic education, in primary education. Personally, I don't see high education as the last stage of a system where you finish and then you're done. Higher education should be structurally linked to basic education. I worked for uh, a short time in the Ministry of Education uh, in, in Mali, 
uh, I was then teaching in Togo, took a, a semester off and uh, uh, decided to go inside a unit where they actually make policies. I was based uh, in the uh, planning unit. And I was struck by the fact that decisions were made without taking into account the new input, uh, new data, uh, where no data analysis took place, no new consideration of the any change, even if it's slight, still it has to be recorded. Attention should be paid to positive and negative changes that were occurring. This was not happening. The planning was done year after year. You carry out the, what was done the year before. And that's a major problem. When I was a visiting professor in, uh, in, in uh, Japan, and uh, for a short time I became part of the Japanese uh, 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 um, uh, system, uh, being paid there, uh, civil servant, and I was struck to see in the public system at least how little the gap is between the salary of uh, elementary school teachers, secondary school teachers, and university teachers. I was shocked to see that. And I inquired, why is that? The logic is, as many studies have shown, early development is critical. And so if you don't set the stage right, it may be too late. So it's very important. The early education of the children is very important. But even if you develop that foundation, if you don't build on it, at the secondary level, it will be waste. And then the higher education. So that says that they are interdependent. That's my conception. So when we have education, educators, people who do research in education, social science in general, their understanding of social phenomena, social dynamics, should help understand best why children are not achieving at a certain level. Why there's still resistance in sending children to school. You know, uh, globally, there have been a lot of effort in the past few years in measuring, measuring achievement. So what are we measuring? Is a measurement reflecting what is being learned? So all these questions, even if studies are being done in industrial countries, the answers are not necessarily relevant for African countries. So we need researchers. So uh, primary, to achieve universal education, we need people who can do research among many other things. We need to develop the teacher training colleges to train more teachers. Uh, recently, I was involved with UNESCO in designing a textbook, uh, a manual, to train teachers with an emphasis on gender, gender sensitivity, that many issues of gender discrimination, of sexual harassment, you name it, that happen uh, in the school system is often out of ignorance. And therefore, you need to train the teachers properly. So we need all this information if we really want to move forward. So that's one of my criticisms. And the same, because of lack of time, we can say the same thing about the gender equality. I will come back to the gender uh, later on uh, with some statistics. And then reduce child mortality. Uh, it's very obvious now that uh, with more information, more knowledge, you can manage life differently. Uh, mothers who are more, uh, have more education are likely to uh, use the information that they have to deal with issues that they are faced with. So same thing here, maternal mortality is a, it's a fact. There are some uh, studies that show the clear correlation between the level of education and uh, probability uh, of uh, surviving uh, pregnancies and, uh, and uh, childbirth and so and so forth. Of course, there are many factors. Those who are highly educated are likely to be also in contexts where there are better services, but still their own education is already uh, a major factor. And combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. 
uh, ensure environmental sustainability and develop uh, um, uh, global partnership for development. Um, having uh, Africans who are, have the knowledge, who are connected to the system, who have the capacity to uh, participate in decision-making processes, to challenge all sorts of issues, to be part of delegations uh, at a, a, a fora where they're discussing those global issues is critical. So not articulating <coughs> specifically the role of higher education is a major shortcoming. Um, and so what I want to, I think, uh, oh yeah, this one does it well also. Uh, you see high, uh, high education is the, the growth of higher education in African countries. And the, uh, you see the title, the explosive growth. And they have been termed like um, uh, as if um, they, they call it, um, um, well, th there is a sense that there are many, many young people who are uh, going to uh, African universities. It's not the case. Uh, there are many uh, overcrowding of uh, existing institutions. Uh, very few. So um, if you compare Africa to the other regions of the world, you see Africa is the one that is in that, uh, um, that uh, tri uh, rectangle. Uh, the growth of higher education actually and the proportion of people who are enrolled, uh, 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 who have the age and are actually enrolled is lower, the lowest compared to all other regions of the world. And so uh, and then the next is, uh, quickly, time has uh, gone, is the issue of gender. Um, I did some study for the UNESCO Institute for Statistics uh, a couple of years ago, and this is, these are the trends we found. Africa is uh, still uh, at the bottom in terms of the uh, representation of women. Uh, where you see the 50 is the line when there's perfect equity. Uh, when it's, uh, the line is it's above, uh, it means there's gender, women overrepresented. When it's below, it is uh, uh, women underrepresented. In most regions of the world, women are underrepresented. And Africa is the region of the world with the lowest representation of women. Another way of capturing the same phenomenon. Um, and uh, here, proportion of uh, females in tertiary uh, by region. Again, here, Africa is uh, lagging behind. Uh, briefly, African development planning. Uh, all African countries have gone recently through specific exercise of, uh, they call it vision, vision 2020, 2035. Uh, but um, in those, they all have uh, decided that Africa should be competitive globally, a competitive economy. And uh, I have been uh, selected with another colleague uh, to review those, uh, those uh, visions uh, by the U United Nations um, uh, Development Institute based in Dakar. And what is striking, they all say the same thing, the ambitions are the same. However, the gender component, the higher education component is not clearly articulated. So the point I'm making here is that it is up to the African countries to resume their national development agendas in which higher education was important. We take a stock. We, we, we must analyze what went wrong with the type of higher education, but not to engage with higher education as a consistent component of the development process is a major uh, mistake. Well, uh, there are a few uh, aspects that I discussed here, but uh, time is up, so I want to just conclude the necessary national local agency taking part in the, in the uh, discussion, in deliberation, whatever agendas are adopted globally, there must be uh, an African own perspective. Um, then the, in this vision, and the, uh, when they have this vision in 2030, we would like to be there, but how do you get there? Specific objectives. And in defining those objectives, higher education uh, with the gender component and all that. Some people have argued uh, what, what a difference would it make if there's a brain drain. Uh, but that's a major issue. 
but it's not the reason why higher education should now not be considered as part. And in fact, from brain drain, there have been a movement to what is called brain circulation. So wherever the Africans are, they are contributing. And there is a, so maybe I would like to stop here so that we can have a conversation. So I thank you very much for listening. Okay.